Last time, we covered a little-known company known as NEC, which teamed up with Hudson to later on make the first 16-bit console, the TurboGrafx. And later on, they decided to adopt a new form of technology which the public wasn't really ready for yet, the compact disc. Sega also responded with the spawning 16-bit era with the Sega Genesis and successfully took down Nintendo's NES-owned market. Nintendo released a successful handheld known as the Game Boy, while Atari and NEC tried to get a head start in the handheld market, but failed miserably. Nintendo finally had a strike back answer to the Genesis owned market with the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. The 16-bit era was ending and 32-bit was coming into play. With the success Nintendo had with the Super Nintendo in Japan, they decided to make a TV. Like the My C1 NES TV in the past, this one was the SF1 SNES TV, also known as Sharp Science Fiction 1. Like the My C1 NES TV, the SF1 came in two different models varying in screen sizes. The larger SF1 TV was 21 inches, while the smaller one was 14 inches. By merging the Super Nintendo with a sharp television, the SF-1 avoided the problem of exposed power cords and other cables. With internally connected terminals, the image quality was noticeably sharper on the SF-1 than any other TV, but however, this advantage was taken away on the 14-inch model as picture quality was reduced. The Super Nintendo built inside of the SF-1 could actually be reset by the remote control without even having to touch the reset button on the console. The SF-1's extended terminals allowed the connectivity to other peripherals, which I'll discuss at a later time. With the sales of home computers falling and video games taking its place, the company Commodore decided to come back with the Commodore Dynamic Total Vision or Compact Disc Television, shortened the Commodore CD-TV. The Commodore CD-TV was pretty much an Amiga 500 home computer in a hi-fi style form factor, which had about a single speed CD-ROM. But just like all video game consoles that Commodore released, the market expectations for the Commodore CD-TV never materialized. The Commodore CD-TV debuted in North America in March of 1991 for a price of about $700. The price wasn't the only thing that instantly killed the Commodore CD-TV. The CD-TV was pretty much as stated before an Amiga 500 home computer. Fans of the Amiga OS avoided the CD-TV at all costs because a CD-ROM drive was being planned for the original Amiga home computer anyway which later materialized into the Amiga A570. When the A570 was released, it was backwards compatible with CD-TV games, so there was little motivation to buy the Commodore CD-TV. And speaking of games, they were also expensive in price, which didn't help sales of the CD-TV either. Outdated software was another reason for the CD-TV's failure. The Commodore CD-TV was bundled with Amiga OS 1.3, instead of the more advanced and user-friendly Amiga 2.0. The CD-TV was intended as a media appliance rather than a personal computer, and its housing and dimensions and form factor reflected this. The CD-TV was bundled with an infrared remote control, but was sold without the keyboard and mouse attachments. At the end of the CD-TV's lifespan, the keyboard and mouse were bundled together, but it was too late to save it. Even though Commodore developed an improved and cost-reduced CD-TV2, it was never released. Two years later, Commodore discontinued the CD-TV in 1993, with only 35 games to add to its name. The Commodore CD-TV suffered the same fate as Commodore's past market failures, such as the Commodore Max Machine and the Commodore C64 GS. Then, on the same year in 1991, the manufacturer Fujitsu made the FM Towns Marty, released only in Japan. The FM Towns Marty was Fujitsu's first attempt into the video game market, and was the first 32-bit home video game console. The FM Towns Marty was based on Fujitsu's earlier FM Towns computer system, which was released in 1989. However, the Marty was backwards compatible with these older FM Towns games. 
Despite the FM Towns Marty being the first 32-bit home video game system and having excellent hardware specs, the FM Towns and FM Towns Marty were very poor sellers in Japan. The FM Towns Marty was expensive, and custom hardware meant expandability wasn't as easy as with it was with DOS V, which was pretty much PCs with Japanese versions of DOS or Microsoft Windows systems. And going back to NEC once again, NEC's PC-98 home computer was also dominant in Japan, so when the FM Towns Marty was released, it barely was noticed. The FM Towns Marty had features way ahead of its time, such as bootable CD-ROMs and a color graphic user interface, something that predated Windows 95 by 7 years. With Fujitsu seeing very few sales with the FM Towns Marty, in 94 they made the FM Towns Marty 2. The Marty 2 featured a darker gray shell and a lower price of 66,000 yen, but otherwise it was identical to the first Marty. Rumors had it that the FM Towns 2 had higher specs, but these were all deemed faults. With all the success that Nintendo was gaining from its portable handheld, the Game Boy, Sega decided it was their turn to try to cash in on the portable video game market. So on April 26, 1991, Sega released the Sega Game Gear. Unlike the original Game Boy, in which the screen was positioned above the buttons, the Game Gear had a screen in landscape position with the controls at the sides, making it less cramping on the hands to hold. Based on an 8-bit processor, the Sega Game Gear was Sega's first handheld game console, and was the third colored handheld in the market, next to the Atari Lynx and the Turbo Express. The Game Gear was invented to be a portable version of Sega's 8-bit console, the Sega Master System. Because of the many similarities between the Sega Master System and the Game Gear, it was fairly easy to port Master System games to the Game Gear. And even Sega released a Master Gear Converter, which allowed the Sega Master System cartridges to be played on the Game Gear directly. About 390 titles were released for the Game Gear's entire lifespan. Sega wanted to make sure they had a wide variety of video game genres that were represented on the handheld, in order to give it a broader appeal. But there were only six launch titles when the Game Gear was released in 1991, which wasn't too appealing at all. Sega realized that Nintendo's packing in game Tetris was one of the reasons why the Game Boy did so well. So to respond to this, the original packing Game Gear title was Columns, which was similar to the Tetris game that Nintendo packed with their Game Boy as well. The price of the Game Gear cartridges ran about $30 and had games like Sonic the Hedgehog, Disney-themed games, and other third-party developer games like Shaq Fu. Following the footsteps of Nintendo's Game Boy, Sega chose to not use any regional lockout on Game Gear cartridges, meaning that any system could play any game regardless of the country they were released in. This practice helped make the handheld more popular among import gamers. But just like NEC's Turbo Express and Atari's Lynx, a color screen meant the battery life suffered very greatly. Just like the Game Boy's 10 to 14 hours with only 4 AA batteries, 6 AA batteries could only get you 4 hours on the Game Gear. And comparing NEC and Atari's struggles to enter the handheld video game market, price went out again. The Game Boy was at a humble price of $90, while the Game Gear was more expensive, listed at a price of $150. The significantly larger price tag drove away many potential Game Gear buyers. Even though the Sega Game Gear was the full-color video game system that separated the men from the boys, the Game Boy still won out and Sega could not dominate Nintendo's handheld video game market share. With the Game Gear not selling significantly, Sega decided a new successor to the Game Gear would put a fresh face in the market for Sega. A successor to the Game Gear was planned to feature a touchscreen interface, but such technology was very primitive and expensive, and the handheld had an estimated cost of about $300. Sega chose to shelve the idea and work on another handheld later on. In 1991, the company Philips made the Philips CDI. The Philips CDI, or Compact Disc Interactive, was an interactive multimedia CD player. The CDI wasn't just a video game console, 
In addition to games, educational and multimedia reference titles were produced, such as interactive encyclopedias, museum tours, and painting galleries. The CDI came out at a price of about $700 and was not received well at all. In fact, the Philips CDI has been rated one of the worst game consoles of all time and was considered a commercial failure by Philips. Even though Philips extensively advertises CDI via infomercial, the interest in CDI remained very, very low. The controller was another weird factor of the CDI and was highly criticized on top of everything else. With the factors of price, graphics, games, and controls, Philips decided that the CDI would be their last console in the video game industry. The video game industry was becoming very profitable and almost every single company was trying to find a way to cash in on it, including Memorex, which released the Tandy Video Information System, or Memorex VIS. Released in 1992 for a price of $700, the Memorex VIS was dead on arrival. Despite the VIS carrying many of the benefits of multimedia without having to purchase a computer, reviewers said the VIS was virtually impossible to sell. With the price point being a killer, the VIS wasn't even a video game console. The VIS's software library was mostly educational and entertainment software. With the price of the CD-ROM discs ranging from $30 to $80, Gamers could care less about a console that just played educational and entertainment software. They would rather spend their money on a more entertaining and engaging video game console, such as a Super Nintendo or Sega Genesis. Along with an extremely depressing software list, two versions of the VIS were released, but both had limited distribution. The first introduction model was the Tandy Video Information System, which retailed for $700 and was only sold in Radio Shack retail outlets. As soon as Tandy discovered the VIS was bombing in the video game market, Tandy got desperate and decided changing the name to the more popular Memrex model might make it sell better. Even though there are no differences between the Memrex and Tandy model, the Memrex model was only available via catalog and sold for $400 instead of the introductory price of $700. Despite the desperate name changing to be a game changer for Tandy, the VIS tanked anyway and was such a huge loss for Tandy, they did not make a video game console ever again. Then, in 1992, the company Watara released the blatant Game Boy ripoff, the Watara Supervision. At a cutthroat price of $50, the Watara Supervision was sure to be a contender for the Game Boy. Despite having a larger screen, more superior technology, and the ability to link up to a television via link cable, the Supervision disappeared into obscurity behind the Atari Lynx, Sega Game Gear, and Turbo Express. Third-party developers had little interest in this handheld as well, as they were most likely already developing games for the Nintendo Game Boy. And just like the Turbo Express, the Watara Supervision had a very cheap build, and sometimes tape and cellophane was inside the units. Screen blurring was also a problem due to the cheap screens that Watara put in, making following the action scenes in a game very difficult. For the short lifespan the Supervision had, the game library only lasted about 65 games in the United States. Knocked down many times, but still not out, the company NEC released the Turbo Duo in 1992 for a staggering $300. The Turbo Duo was basically a duo combination of the TurboGrafx-16 and TurboGrafx CD hardware built inside. Plus, the system BIOS had a little bit of extra RAM built into the motherboard. The Turbo Duo was able to play audio CDs, graphics CDs, Turbo Graphics Turbo Chips, and North American Turbo Graphics CD ROMs. When NEC discovered that $300 was too steep for many consumers, they decided to add a couple pack-ins to add value to the console. Some of the pack-ins included Yeastbook 1 and 2, a Super CD including Bonk's Adventure, Bonk's Revenge, Gate of Thunder, and a coupon book to save money on extra Turbo Duo games and accessories. 
Unfortunately, NEC didn't stand a chance against Sega. With their marketing and advertising, Sega's new upcoming product that year became a more popular platform in North America than the Turbo Duo. In 1993, just a year later, many large chain stores no longer carried the Turbo Duo. And by 1995, the Turbo Duo breathed its last. With the precedent for new technology changing with the TurboGrafx CD, the company Sega decided they could release their own CD add-on for their game console. With the idea of compact discs becoming more popular, Sega decided to use this idea as well. So in 1992, Sega released the Sega CD. Granted, the Mega CD was released for the Mega Drive in Japan a year before in 1991. The Sega CD came in two different versions. The first version of the Sega CD sat underneath the Genesis, and CDs were loaded with a motorized tray. The second version of the Sega CD placed a top-loading CD-ROM drive to the right of the console, and was intended primarily for the second build of the Sega Genesis. The Sega CD could also play audio CDs and CD graphic discs. The Sega CD boasted very much about full-motion video and CD audio soundtracks, but because the Sega Genesis had a limited color palette and limited data bandwidth, full motion video was heavily dithered and limited to a small rectangle in the center of the screen. Some Sega CD games such as Bram Stoker's Dracula actually showed scenes from the movie. However, these scenes were heavily dithered and not nice to look at at all. Sega wanted to show off the power of the Sega CD, but with the capacity of the Genesis cartridges being small, not many companies were ready to take the plunge and adapt to a larger capacity of a storage medium, especially when the Genesis was hindered by its own limitations. When Sega saw their technology was already in use for most Laserdisc arcade games, video seemed the best choice, so they focused on full motion video games. Like the controversial Sega CD game that focused on full motion video, Night Trap, which will come back later in the timeline. Even though Sega was adopting the future with compact discs with the Sega CD, most of the software library was considered shovelware or not very good games at all. Most Sega CD games just added a few minor content, most of the time an audio soundtrack or video sequences, while not changing much about the game itself, thus making it not worth a purchase. Despite the Sega CD having mostly lackluster titles, some games such as Snatcher, Spider-Man vs. the Kingpin, Earthworm Jim, Sonic CD, and the Lunar series were actually games that stuck out and had a future later on with Sega. Sega thought they had an edge on Nintendo with the advertised quote, There is no Nintendo CD. But in fact, there almost was. Now, to describe our next element in the timeline of the history of video games, we have to go back to 1988, the era of Nintendo and the Famicom. In mid-1980, a Sony engineer named Ken Kutaraji bought his daughter a Nintendo Famicom. Ken, however, was not impressed with the sound chips on the Famicom and decided he could engineer a better product. Sony was against this, but the idea of Nintendo buying Ken's designs would make them money, so they decided to go with it. Ken showed Nintendo his sound chip designs, and they were sold. As a result, the Super Nintendo had a sound chip that was designed by the Sony engineer, Ken Kutaraji. Nintendo got to use Sony's sound chip in the Super Nintendo, but also as part of the agreement, Sony was allowed to develop a CD add-on for the Super Nintendo as well. Sony got to work quickly on the first build of the Super Nintendo CD add-on, the Super Disc. The Super Disc could play Sony CDs as well as Super Nintendo cartridges. All seemed well with the Nintendo and Sony partnership, but three years later, Nintendo discovered they made a grave mistake. One of the agreements that Nintendo formed with Sony was that the Super Disc and any CD-based game was property of Sony's. This meant that all profits made by the Super Disc and Super Disc games were property of Sony and not Nintendo. Nintendo realized they'd lose a lot of money with this deal, so they decided to act fast. When the Philips CDI was released, Nintendo saw the CDI as the future of video games and decided to sign a deal with Philips. Part of the agreement was that Philips could get Nintendo-based games with Nintendo characters on the CDI. 
Phillips would also be in charge of creating Nintendo a Super Nintendo CD add-on. However, this time, Nintendo would get complete licensing control over the CD add-on and the CD add-on based games. They didn't want to make the same mistake they did with Sony. The Nintendo based games that appeared on the CDI were Link Faces of Evil, Zelda Wand of Gamelon, Zelda's Adventure, and a Mario based game named Hotel Mario. Needless to say, even though these games were licensed by Nintendo, they were the worst four games on the entire console and possibly were the contributing reason for the CDI's demise. In 1991, at CES, Nintendo showcased the Super Nintendo before its launch, and also got to see Sony's PlayStation with two words. The Sony PlayStation could play Super Nintendo games and CD-ROMs, as well as music and movies. Nintendo eyed the PlayStation as being very profitable for Sony, and Nintendo getting nothing out of it. When the time came for Nintendo to finalize the partnership with Sony, Nintendo backed out and said they had a deal with Philips. Now Philips was Sony's rival, so this angered them very much. Sony saw Nintendo as a backstabber, with two different partnerships with two different rival companies behind each other's backs. After Sony realized Nintendo had a deal with Philips, Sony decided to make their own console. So on the same year at the Tokyo Show in 91, Sony unveiled the PlayStation. Once again, two separate words. This new build of the PlayStation was a standalone from the Super Nintendo, but could pretty much do the same things as the PlayStation prototype from CES. In 1992, the official cancellation of the Nintendo-Sony alliance was complete, and Philips said they would complete the Super Nintendo add-on by Christmas season. At the same time, Sega unveiled the Sega CD. So, as a way for Sony to get back at Nintendo, Sony partnered up with Nintendo's rival Sega to make games for the Sega CD. Publishers were not too keen about this idea, as consoles were changing faster than publishers could make games for them. Nintendo's board urged Nintendo to strike a deal with Sony, and Philips, at the same time. The agreement was that everyone would go to a single CD format, and the games for the Sony PlayStation and the Philips CD add-on were property of Nintendo. Sony would get licensing control over non-game releases, such as educational programs, movies, and music. So at the end of the deal, the SNES Nintendo Disc was created, or known as Philips CD-ROM XA. This new format came in its own case to prevent damage to the CD, and mostly prevent illegal copying as well. All other add-ons were scrapped, and all three companies decided to make an add-on together. This new Sony and Philips add-on was called the Super NES Nintendo Disk Drive. This new 32-bit add-on would attach to the bottom of the Super Nintendo, along with a Super cartridge that would plug in, which would be plugged in by the external port. Later that year, however, Nintendo announced the Super FX chip. So the 32-bit add-on would have to be updated in order to work with the chip, thus delaying progress even more. In 1993, Nintendo unveiled the Super NES CD-ROM specs in an issue of Electric Gaming Monthly. The add-on was set to be released in 1994 for about a price of $200. Rumor had it that a new Legend of Zelda, Super Mario, Final Fantasy, and Street Fighter II games were in development for the system. The article revealed that the Super Nintendo CD games, or Philips CD-ROM XA, would be also playable on the Philips CDI console as well. The main system cartridge was placed into the normal slot. This cartridge contained a chip that handled the communication between the Super Nintendo and the Nintendo CD-RAM memory, using a system called HANDS, or Hyper Advanced Nintendo Data Transfer System. Later that year, however, the Super NES CD-ROM was a no-show at CES. Instead, more Super Nintendo games, like Super Mario All-Stars, were announced in its place. Before the close of 1993, Nintendo made it official that the SNES CD add-on was cancelled, and quoted, Essentially, the need to continue developing an SNES add-on became obsolete. One of the reasons for this costly decision by Nintendo was because of the instant doomed market response of the Philips CDI, 
and the less than lackluster support of the Sega CD. Nintendo decided the public still wasn't ready yet for the compact disc and games. Plus, the Super Nintendo was 16-bit, so any CD add-on would be very limited, just like the Sega CD on the Genesis. Instead, Nintendo developed more SNES games that used the effects chip, like Donkey Kong Country, which is one of the most polished and best-looking games on the console. Nintendo proved to its fans that it didn't need the compact disc to make wonderfully looking games. After all, Nintendo quoted that the future of CD-ROMs belonged to the snails. With the developments of the FX chip in place, Nintendo decided any further developments in the SNES were not needed, and decided to focus its efforts on a new next-gen console. On the same year in 1993, Nintendo announced its partnership with Silicon Graphics to create a 3D, 64-bit Nintendo gaming console named the Ultra 64. Philips tricked many people into buying Nintendo-based games for its doomed console, and Sony got a lot of experience in the game industry, which is arguably the best out of the three. With the experience that Sony acquired from the failed Nintendo partnership, Sony discovered that they didn't need anyone's help to venture out on their own. Sony finished the work on a number of SNES and Genesis games, but they scrapped the old Play Station design developed for Nintendo, and decided to build a Nintendo-less 32-bit CD-only game console to compete with Nintendo in Japan and North America. This would not be the last time Nintendo would see Sony. Due to their disagreements in the past, Sony was out for revenge, blood, and Nintendo's market share. The consequences for Nintendo severing their partnership with Sony caused Sony to be their eternal enemy to this day. If the deal with Nintendo and Sony never fell through, the history of video games would have spanned out much differently. While Sega was selling its Genesis with maturity and violence, Nintendo also had a strict censorship policy, and they were very picky about any game that was violent on their console. However, a game would come out that would trump this policy. Mortal Kombat. Mortal Kombat was an arcade fighting game that featured splashes of blood and finishing moves that often depict one character dismembering the other. Because the Genesis version retained the gore and the Super Nintendo version did not, it outsold the Super Nintendo version by a ratio of 3 or 4 to 1. The violence in video games that Mortal Kombat showed was starting to get attention. Negative attention. Mainly the attention of two senators, Herb Cole and Joe Lieberman. Mortal Kombat and other controversial games that were released during the same time were causing much stir between Senators and parents. Mortal Kombat wasn't the only game that appeared in Senator Lieberman's crosshairs. The Konami shooting game Lethal Enforcers was also attacked. Mr. Lieberman stated that the weapon of choice in Lethal Enforcers, the light gun peripheral, the Konami Justifier, had no right being in the hands of impressionable children at a young age. He also stated that the realistic revolver-like shape of the Justifier provoked gun violence. Nintendo wasn't safe either, despite Howard Lincoln of Nintendo stating to Mr. Lieberman that Lethal Enforcers was rejected on their console because of its violence, Mr. Lieberman dubbed Nintendo's light gun peripheral, the Super Scope, as an assault weapon. He also stated that the controversial FMV-driven game Night Trap objectified women very much. He cited Night Trap as shameful, ultra-violent, sick, and disgusting. And Night Trap was an encouraging effort to trap and kill women. Mr. Lieberman failed to realize, however, that the goal of Night Trap is to save the women and not kill them. The most controversial argument in Night Trap, however, was the infamous Nightgown scene. If the player didn't trap the antagonist in the game, the augers in time, they would grab the damsel in distress and drain her blood. Despite the non-realistic blood drain device and the acting, Mr. Lieberman still found this scene very offensive due to the fact that the damsel in distress is scantily clad and attacked in a bathroom. Despite Nintendo playing it safe with censorship policies, Sega and Nintendo were both attacked for this war on violent video games. Senator Herb Cole and Joe Lieberman bashed and attacked 
video game companies for showing little interest in rating any product they released. Their ultimatum to Nintendo and Sega was to establish and implement a well enough rating system in one year, or the government would do it for them. Unfortunately, Nintendo and Sega couldn't comply with the federal government's demands on time, and thus the federal government appointed a board to rate all video games. The board was called ESERP, or Entertainment Software Rating Board. This practice would make sure that all games were rated so parents could see the front and know what content the game had. Because Sega and Nintendo showed very little interest in rating any games themselves. With ESERP in place, Nintendo decided censorship policies were no longer needed. Consequently, the uncensored Super Nintendo port of Mortal Kombat 2 became the fan favorite. Next time on the History of Video Games. More unsightly peripherals for the Genesis are in its future. Atari comes back in the video game market and jumps the gun with the first 64-bit console. But was it actually 64-bit? And finally, Nintendo's old partner but new rival Sony will be a contender against them in the video game market. Will the experience that Sony acquired from the failed partnership be enough to take down Nintendo's market share? That and much more to come on the history of video games. See you later!